very grand presentation, introduction. Um, so for the past five years, my humble job has been to um, contribute to uh, a huge systemic cultural behavioral change process in all the foods. It is one of the largest dairy cooperatives in the world, owned by 13,600 farmers, has 19,000 people working globally in 30 different countries. Um, my job has been to create a pull effect, a bottom-up movement of getting 19,000 people to be more inclusive of differences. And um, it's easier said than done. Uh, it's an organization that's grown by about 60% the five years I've been there. Um, and the customers and the consumers and the employees are diversifying faster than we can even notice it. Um, so how do you get people to leverage those differences when, as we heard Dr. Gray say yesterday, this kind of goes against our nature? Um, and that's what I want to share with you today. My next hour with you is from an internal practitioner's experience to you as internal practitioners, and how can we do this so that we don't have to convince people, that we don't have to push people. So this is not about compliance or ticking the box. How can we make it easy for people to be more inclusive of these differences? I want to share with you the techniques of inclusion nudges. This is really when you apply techniques and insights from behavioral economics and apply it to the field of inclusion diversity. But first I want to start by asking each one of you some questions. Do you consider yourself as a person who treats other people fair? Just raise your hand if, if that's the case. A lot. Do you consider yourself a person who gives people equal opportunities to contribute with their potential and their skills and their knowledge, their know-how, and give them an equal opportunity to advance in your organization? Do you have a good intention to do so? More people, right? Do you consider yourself a person who discriminates others? Just a few. All right. I'll return to those questions later. I will argue that these kind of questions we need to address significantly different. These issues we need to deal with differently than what we do in most organizations today. If we are ever to leverage the full potential of each individual in our organizations, those human resources that we're all working on getting something good out of, if we are ever to make sure that those diversity of perspectives and knowledge and know-how are being leveraged for better performance and innovation. I believe that the, the, that the organizations of the future, those successful organizations of the future, will be those that master inclusion of diversity. And, and by diversity, I mean every kind of difference. I mean the cognitive difference, differences in the head. You know, the different lens we see complex issues with, the different way we filter information the different identities that we bring to work, uh, the demographic differences. This is not just about gender or minorities. Inclusion, by that I mean we use it, we utilize it, we put it to work when we solve our task, when we make important decisions. Inclusion means that everybody can go to work and be the full self, don't have to tone down sides of themselves to fit in. And the business case is clear, you know, we have, we have plenty of research showing that diverse teams, they outperform homogenous teams. Diverse teams, they will also outperform teams that are composed of highly um, intellectual people with high IQ. Also, if we, we, if we compose a team of only high performers, the diverse teams will always outperform them. If they have an inclusive culture and inclusive leadership. On the other hand, we also know that diverse teams can act as homogenous teams. If we don't have an inclusive culture or the group dynamics allow us conformity and just that group think. So why is it when the business case is so clear that we don't see enough changes in this area? It's just too slow. I believe it's because the unconscious mind is playing some tricks with us. And as an anthropology, having you know, studied and worked with you know, uh, tribe people, I, I say we are like tribe people. We want to be with similar others. It makes us feel safe. And regardless what kind of similar others, it doesn't really matter if they just have a similarity to you. We create these psychological in-groups. 
When you create an in-group, that can be based on the same skin color, the same gender, the same um, educational background, or the same, you know, I work in innovation, you work in HR, or I'm in supply chain, and you are in marketing. Those us and them, we create them all the time. It makes us feel safe. We find people in our in-groups more believable, credible. We are more skeptical to people who are the different ones, those from the other groups, the other tribes. So Yale University, they had this baby cognition center. And what they found was, as early as the age of three months, babies know what's right and wrong. So they do this with puppies. You should, you should check it out. It's on YouTube. It's really, really great. They do this with puppies. And the babies, they look at the puppy who's treating the other puppies good. Look at them longer, and that's a sign that they feel safer with them. They don't even look at the puppies that's treating the others bad. At the age of six months, though, interesting things happen. Now the babies will prefer those puppies who have the same preference as them. That could be like a food preference. They will prefer them even though they treat the others bad. So we know morally what's right and wrong to do, but yet we find it okay to treat the others bad. It's in our genes. It's not because we're racist or evil people. It's just a very natural part of being a human being. So that's how it is. But it really affects how we interact with people in our organizations more than we tend to think. So I say that we are tribe people with brain, uh, Stone Age brains. It's not overly optimistic on a Wednesday morning in Amsterdam, but there is, there's hope because there are techniques for us to embrace this and take those behavioral insights, turn them from being a barrier to being an enabler in our organizations. So instead of me telling you about this, I want to do an exercise with you. First, I want to tell you a little bit about how that mind of ours works. When we meet people, we have this survival uh, mode that activates. It's like a danger detector. So could I stay safe here? Should I attack these people? Should I run? Is it OK? Do they want me good? Do they want to do me good? Do I believe in them? Um, do I find them likable, trustworthy? So we scan people on this in a split second. And warmth always rates higher on competency. That's the next we rate people on, in a split second. Do they have informal authority, power? Do I believe that we could work together? Do they have the abilities? Do they have the skills they need? We might not know what they're supposed to be competent in, but your brain knows. Because you're a part of a global norm of how people are supposed to look and act and behave and talk to be perceived as competent. So let's do an exercise. Now we're going to look inside your brains. Now we're going to look how this brain of ours work instead of me telling you. So your job now is to take a piece of paper and a pen and quickly draw up this little scorecard. You don't have to write the text on the top, but six numbers, and you make a column with warmth and a column with competency. So when you've done that, we do the exercise. I'll show you some people, and then you'll be rating them. So how we rate people unconsciously in a split second is dominating our behavior and interaction with them, how we process the information they give us, how we knowledge share with them, how we listen to what they say. If we hire them, promote them, invite them into our network, invite them for meetings, share the information that's important for them to know to perform well, all kinds of stuff. Are you ready? OK. So the jobs, I'll show you six people. And you rate them. On a scale from one to five, five being the warmest, five being the most competent. By the way, this is an exercise we do in all the foods with all the managers and, and the employees. It's an integrated part of the leadership training. It's an integrated part of the performance calibration process. This is really about spotting your patterns. Yeah? You ready? And, and, and I, will, I will predict that I can tell almost what all of you in here is going to rate these people. It's not scary stuff. Like, I'm not psychic. It's not like I'm looking inside your brains. It's just because you're really just all a part of a global norm. 
Okay, so let's take a look at this. You ready? Yeah? Good. And I, I just want to say one more thing. This is not an exercise in being political correct. So if you look at your rating, right, and you think, oh my goodness, that's prodigious. I'm going to write something else to look better. Don't do that. Because this is really not about looking good. This is about paying attention to what's going on inside that unconscious mind of yours. So I give you 10 seconds. Your brain did it in a split second. I give you 10 seconds to pay attention. Yeah? OK, here we go. Okay, now we're going to look for patterns. This kind of research about warmth and competency and how we socially perceive people is based on uh, research done by Amy Cuddy, psychologist from Howard Business School and some of her research colleagues from other universities. Um, uh, this exercise that we're doing now is originally developed by Cook Ross, an organization I worked with in Olive Foods for many years. I've mod modified this over the years. And the interesting part is that the, that the Cuddy team, they did this kind of experiments and research in about four different continents and 19 different countries. Cook Ross have done this with 10 different nationalities, and I've done this in, in, in all about 10 different countries with about 2,000 people. Um, and the interesting part is there are patterns that we are all a part of. So let's check out yours. This is Pratipa Patil. She used to be the president of India. She is an economist and an attorney. Normally, she scores high on warmth, lower on competency. Is there anybody in here who scored her highest on competencies and low on warmth? Low on warmth? OK, so we have one. One out of, of this entire group. What's interesting is how we perceive people on warmth and competency matters in terms of we're active involved with them or passive or if we actually harm them or just neglect them. But that we will look at in a second. This is Ted Bundy, <laughs> serial killer. Normally, people love him. He scores high on competency and warmth. Anybody in here who scored him low on anything? Do you score him low on warmth? Yeah? Anybody scored him just high on, uh, on warmth? A few. Quite a few. I know why. It's because he fits the perfect norm, that unwritten rule of how you're supposed to look in the organizations. It's called the Mr. Corporate Masculinity Norm. It goes across North America, Europe, Asia. So our brain immediately picks up that's how you're supposed to look. And the norm is, per definition, masculine, because if you look around the world, about 92% of the people with power, they are men. It doesn't mean that you can't be perceived as a woman as competent. It just means that men are always a couple of steps ahead. And it doesn't matter if women are masculine, because that's just a mishmash in our head. We don't recognize it, because women are supposed to be feminine. So there's a lot of stuff going on. This is Trolls. Trolls is uh, a specialist in creating behavioral changes in children. He has a track record in helping adolescent boys getting back on track. 
he is uh, the father of three girls, and he takes care of about 60% of all the caretaking activities at home. He's a very warm guy. Normally, he scores low on warmth, low on competency. Anybody in here who scored him high? Anything? Warmth? So I want to introduce you to my husband, Trolls, and my grandma, Esther. <laughs> All right, so my grandma, Esther, who's 95, she loves trolls. He makes her feel safe. Is trolls not coming today, she says, when I arrive with my children. She says, oh, what a shame. I just kind of like uh, couldn't care less if we came now. That's, that's a joke. But what's interesting about trolls is he's one of those people we could use a little bit more in our organization. So I haven't worked in organizations for a long time. Um, I would say if we could just have a little bit more people who were interested in making other people perform better, working for the greater good and not just for your own KPIs, you would want to have more people like trolls. But unfortunately, we choose the Ted Bundys. It's not because we are not, we're deselecting my husband. It's because, <laughs> I know, he would be a bit sad. No, bald-headed people with beard, they don't fit the norm. If you look in your organizations, how many people, and especially those with the power, have a big beard? A lot? A few? Good. If you're in the creative sector, there are more. The hipsters. But in most corporate organizations today, they're not there. So the question is, what are we missing out on by selecting and making our brain drive these kind of, you know, really, really quick um, unconscious uh, associations and evaluations. This is uh, Oksana. She is Miss Universe. She's a fashion model. She is also a PhD in, in, in civil uh, law, and she is, has been captain of the Russian police. What's interesting about her, she normally scores high on warmth but low on competency. Anybody here who does it differently? High on competency? Only high on competency. Oh, so about... 10. So that's pretty good, actually. What's interesting is that she's just immediately kind of shoved down in this sexuality box, and that kind of messes up how competent we perceive her. So I was doing this with a lot of uh, master students from a business school, and uh, I, I had my hopes, because everybody keeps telling me, oh, Tina, what's the fuss about this inclusion diversity? You know, the new generation entering the, the work market, you know, they will make the difference, right? They are so exposed to diversity, they will nail it. You know, we don't have to do all this work. So I was doing this with them, I had high hopes. They scored this woman the lowest in competence. I say, take a look, you know, turn around. There were 30 in the room, and we had about 60% of them were beautiful women. They turn around, they look at each other, and they go, oh! Oh my God, we just scored ourselves really incompetent. I was like, because you're part of the norm. And then I go, oh, that's scary. Exactly, this is scary. And we can change this, that's the good part. This is Jack. He's um, very wealthy, but he has a big social heart. So he gives away most of his, uh, his uh, income for charity. Jack normally scores high in competency, but low on warmth. Anybody scored him only high on warmth? Two? Three? Regardless of who I put up here, and I always choose Asians who are highly successful, but who gives most of their uh, income away for charity. They rarely get the credit for it. Asians are often perceived as competent like this, but not very high on warmth in our part of the world. Because if you have Asians rate Asians, they would rate them higher, whereas we, you know, we're from our own tribe. So in that sense, we, it differs where we do it. This is Christopher James, Chris Christie. I don't know if you know him. He's governor, governor of New Jersey. Some of you in here probably know him. Supposed to be viewed as a potential presidential candidate for the election 2016. What's interesting about him is that he, when you Google his name, you get about 10 million hits where his body size is mentioned. When he had a fat surgery, the number of supporters went up, went through the roof. And uh, researchers say overweight people, there's often this implicit association to overweight equals weakness, lack of self-discipline. So when he all of a sudden showed that he lost weight, it doesn't mean it's the same as saying he has self-discipline, but the brain just picks up like this now. 
He can control our country because he can control our body. If you look inside your own organizations, how many overweight people are working in your headquarters? Not a lot, not a whole lot. And especially not on the way up through your career when you're advancing, it doesn't work. When you're kind of up there having the power, that's okay to kind of build a little stomach and it's a status symbol. Or you have to run a marathon. That's also like two trends going on. So that might be a little provocative, but look inside your organizations. I'm asking you, how many overweight people do you have? Statistically, this doesn't match the world. It doesn't match. There are so many overweight people. Not, not a single researcher have been able to prove that overweight people are not as smart or high-performing people as us. It becomes these self-fulfilling prophecies. If you don't hire them, how are they going to show that they could make a difference? So just a quick wrap-up of, of this uh, research, what, what it's showing. What the research has found is if we rate people high on warmth and competency, they can monitor the brain as they're doing these kind of exercises. And they monitor and they find that the part of the brain that's activated when we rate them high on both is the part of the brain where the feeling admiration is placed. If it's low on warmth but high on competency, envy. The Chinese, the, the Asians, the rich. Up here we have the white. If it's low on both, contempt. High on warmth but low on competency, pity. This drives our behavior by 80 to 90 percent. If we rate people high on warmth, we feel safe. We will be more active in our involvement with them. We will seek them out for knowledge sharing. We will hire them in. We will feel feel safe if they at the same time are competent. If it's low on warmth, active harm. It doesn't mean that we are beating up people in our workplaces, trip, you know, kicking them and doing weird things. It just really means that sometimes there are some people that we talk to in a harder manner. Or that we ask more critical questions or we don't position them as much or whatever it is that we don't do or do. So look at your own patterns. Is there anybody that can kind of make you snap faster? Anybody who doesn't get as much feedback or only get the negative feedback and not the positive feedback? These are, you know, how this plays out. If it's high on warmth, more like a passive involvement. So our brain scans these people as competent, but doesn't. So if they tell us something or give us information or knowledge, we will process it. We don't necessarily seek it out, but we will use it. If it's low on competence, it's much more like a passive neglect. You know, our people in our organizations, they're crying for more informal feedback. Take a look in your own way of giving that informal feedback. Who gets it and who doesn't? And the people who doesn't get that informal feedback, who's not guided by the managers, that's passive neglect. So this norm is strong. If we look around the world, actually height has a huge impact. Look at studies from the United States. They found that 60% of the CEOs in the American company, the biggest companies, are above 185 centimeters. That's my height. And uh, when they look in the general population, they found that only 14% had that height. It's not like the recruitment committee is sitting there thinking, we're going to choose and select the tallest because he's tall. The long legs, it makes a difference for how he executes the strategy. That's not happening. It's because we have this implicit association to height, you know, authority and power and, you know, the strong leader, we can, we can follow him. We feel safe, right? And this isn't, we also found, and research have found, what's really interesting is per inch, they get more in salary. <laughs> right? Ridiculous. And I do say he. And it's not an unconscious bias of mine when you're talking about leaders and I say he. It is because it doesn't count as much for women. Some of you might have been thinking, Jesus, she's getting really good salary. Doesn't count for women the same way. But this norm, the unwritten rule of how you're supposed to be to be perceived intuitively as competent, materializes into a quite painful reality. Asians choose to have their leg lengthened. China banned these kind of surgeries. Simply have 
your bones broken, implants inserted, and you get stretched for about a year. It's painful and it costs a lot of money. Asians are smart people. They do this because they want to fit into the norm. They look around, they see who, who gets the jobs, who has the status, who gets ahead in this world, who can influence. We need longer legs. Now there's an industry because now they have to travel to, to the countries where they do these kind of surgeries. The other thing that's going on is almond shaped eye surgeries. Simply having an eyelid gives you more, I don't know, status. People listen more. You see it? Can you hear it? it? Sounds absolutely crazy. My invitation to you today is we need to change this norm. We cannot wait for people to change to fit the norm. It is ridiculous waste of human resources. And it all starts with each one of us in this room. The impact of accent has also been proven for a long time. Simply we believe people more who have the same dialect or accent as ourselves. It simply just resonates better in our heads. We believe them more. We process more what they say. And a lot of us work in international organizations and people are speaking English with a weird accent sometimes. We gotta have to pay attention to the content a little bit more and not allow our brains to be just disturbed by, by the accent. We might not think it does, but start seeing, start paying attention, try it out, pay attention. What kind of accent triggers you, provokes you, or makes you a little, ah, I can hardly listen to what they say. Pay attention to these. So I um, just want to show you a little awareness test. So if you, the technicians could uh, put on this um, movie. Knowing, giving this the fact. This is an okay. awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! This is the city of London who did this in terms of getting people to pay more attention to the bikes. I use this because, and I know that given the fact that I'm with HR people, a lot of you have, have seen this, um, but how many of you who haven't seen it saw the bear the first time? A few, well done. Did you also count to 13 at the same time? A few, oh wow, that's quite impressive. Well done. Um, what, what, what I use this for when, when I interact with the leaders and, and managers of the organizations I, I operate in is really to help them, you know, there's a lot of things we don't see and there are a lot of people we never notice, a lot of information we never use because we're simply not looking for it. The question is what are we losing out on, what are we not seeing, what are we missing out on? And asking these questions is not just something like, oh, asking a question, no. It is a proven fact that the brain is twice as miserable about what, it lose, what, what we're losing than we are gaining the exact same thing. So asking these kind of questions will actually make us a little bit more motivated to find out, hmm, hey, what could I be missing out on? So these, you know, all these different implicit associations, they might be just minor actions like micro behaviors, but they really, really have a major impact on how we operate and, and manage our organizations and get the best out of our people. So they, they come out as like micro behaviors, micro advantages and micro inequities we might not even notice. So the other day I was flying and then Stuart that's next to me, she was saying to one of the, the, the people on the plane, she was like, um, so, so we're taking off, you should turn off your phone, please. So she's walking down the aisle. I'm just reading my paper. I'm not really paying attention. And she, she goes, oh, you know what? We're about to take off. And um, so if you could just, you know, turn off your phone. And, you know, shouldn't I help you? Like, give me the phone. Give me the phone. I'm, I'm going to help you. So I'm like, what? I'm turning around. And she's talking to, like, an 80-year-old woman. She's saying the exact same message. But 
what's happening here is that he just puts away his phone. She might even be losing and dropping it on the floor just out of, ugh, now I can't even do it. She, she, she had an iPhone, right? So something she must be able to do. Had we interviewed this stewardess afterwards to ask her why she asked them so differently or told them the same information so differently, she probably wouldn't have noticed. It's just micro behavior. It's the same with job interviews, right? Those people that's from our own tribe, we feel safe with, that we recognize intuitively, they get a lot of nods. Like, uh-huh, mm, oh, oh, yeah, could you give me an example? Mm, mm -hmm. And those from the other tribe, they get this. Imagine how that will affect people in terms of how they perform in that situation. And the people we like, they get less critical questions. They seduce us with the good stories. So that mindless choosing is like often we are so sophisticated that we just look for data that confirms what we believe in in the first place. That's why it's so difficult to notice that what we do, most of it is irrational because we can find all these rational arguments. But they actually become self-fulfilling prophecies. We can make people perform better by treating them as great performers and vice versa. All right, so spotting your patterns, this is an invitation. This is online, it's free. The Project Implicit, they have this implicit association test. I invite you to take this. It is an eye-opener. It's testing what's going on inside your unconscious mind. So I've been working in this field of work for about 14 years. When I took this on gender and leadership, there's 70 different, 17, no, 70 different subjects you can test yourself on. I did it on leadership and gender. It was a huge surprise to me that I had a negative association to women and leadership. I was like, ah, oh my goodness. This is horrible, but you know, just the fact that I noticed this pattern and saw it has changed because a couple years later I took it and had changed. So it's, we can have good intentions, but that might not just play out in, in actions. Well, make a little trick with yourself. Ask yourself in the situation, if he was not a he, but if he was a she, would I have reacted differently to what he or she just did? And a lot of times we can answer yes. That will give you like a little emotional trigger, like frustration or being annoyed or being oh, surprised. Or ask, if he was not 20 years old but had 25 year, or 20 years of experience more than me, would I have listened to him more? These are little trick questions you can use in the situation to force your brain to not be so dominated by the unconscious. So back to the questions I asked you in the beginning. Even though we have a good intention, our actions like we saw with the pictures, might be different. And there's a huge risk or likability that we are likely to act opposite our good intentions, and that's what's going on in most organizations today. And you cannot convince people that they are biased. You can tell them a lot of rational arguments, but it doesn't change the behavior. So if we look at the two systems of the brain, I use Daniel Kahneman's System 1 and System 2 to kind of make this a little bit easier to, to work with as, as a change agent. System 1 is the fast automatic system where all those unconscious biases are. And System 2 is the slow, controlled part of the brain where we can make these, you know, we can make complex calculations and we can reflect and we can think logical and we can look for the rational arguments. But if we just look at this, so which one here do you see as the darkest, square A or square B? A. I hope all of you see A as the darkest, or else you should you know, go to the doctors, have your eyes checked, but this is, this is A here. So if I change the background, you see it's the exact same color. Yet, now you know, with your rational mind, that these are the same colors, right? Change it back, what do you see? Right? Scary? You know that they're the same color. You don't see them as the same colors, do you? No. It's easy because we're tr the, the, this part of the brain is kind of looking for the patterns, and there's supposed to be a pattern here. So these two mind systems doesn't always work together. So if you try to convince people with their rational mind that they're biased, we can't see it. It doesn't make us see it. It doesn't make us change our behavior. We need other techniques. And the... So what do we do in this world? The, the, you know, the world is constantly changing. There's so much complexity. We're asking people to reflect upon their behavior and make behavioral changes. It's just too hard. We're asking too much of our people. So what can we do when the brain and human mind is not changing accordingly to how the world is changing? 
And this is where these techniques of behavioral economics and inclusion nudges comes into the play. Um, I use these techniques to motivate people for change and make it easy for them to change without having to reflect upon this and to change the entire perception around diversity and inclusion. I'll give you really concrete examples from all the foods, but also from other organizations um, that have contributed to this. When we talk about behavior changes, I use this brain analogy by psychologist Jonathan Haidt. He says that the, the mind, system one and system two, is kind of like an elephant and its rider. So imagine that the unconscious mind is as big as a six-ton heavy elephant. And the conscious mind, the rational mind, that gets the business case, that gets the data, it understands why this is important. It's only the little rider on top of the elephant. It can point to the right direction, say, we need more inclusion. We get it. This is important. But if that elephant is not motivated to move, there is no way that a tiny rider can move a six-ton heavy elephant. That's where the behavior is. That's the part of the brain that's dominating the behavior. That's the part of the brain that's actually doing the behavior is the one walking. For me, it makes it a lot easier as a change agent to work with this. Because what I found was that most of the times when I had actually succeeded in creating behavioral changes, I had appealed to the elephant. When I had not, and that was unfortunately the majority of my time, I had only talked to the rider. Behavioral economics. I'm going to give you a few examples of, of what this is, but just to give you an idea. A standard, you know, a standard economic model will say that we are unbounded, uh, rational human beings. We have a lot of willpower. We can change behavior by willpower, and we are selfless, selfish people. But behavioral economics, they challenge this and say, we're not that rational. We're quite irrational people. We... Um, we don't have that much willpower. It's just too hard to change behavior with willpower. And we are really not that selfish. We will do other, a lot of other things. It's not just about fulfilling our own needs. I, I use this book, Switch. I can encourage you to take a lot of great examples in this. This has been my Bible for a lot of years. Um, and I also use this book about nudge. Not just like an in, you know, behavioral interventions. It's really about changing the context that you operate in. It's about changing um, the context you make decisions in and get people to act in accordance with their good intentions. So what happens when you take this and apply this to, inclusion, uh, to, to creating inclusive organizations? It makes it just a lot easier. But I'm going to give you a few examples of, of what these techniques can do. This is for an example from a hospital in Denmark. They needed to motivate the doctors to change their behavior. The strategy was the patient is in the center. We are here for the patient. So nobody had that doubt about that. But the problem was that the doctors were not showing up at the right time for the consultancies in the morning. So the secretaries were frustrated. They were frustrated because the system were crashing. The patients were you know, being thrown off the line, and the whole phone system was a mess. They, they addressed this and said, listen, it's a problem you're not showing up at the right time. And they were like, what are you, what are you talking about? Right? It didn't fit their self-perception of being professional doctors. So what they did was they took four glasses see-through glasses, they bought four different pearls, different colors, and they just informed the doctors, when you show up in the morning, what we will do for each one of you is we will put a yellow pearl in when you are almost here, a green when you're here, red when you're not here on time, and a purple if the system crashes. The first week, there was a lot of red pearls in the glass. The second week, half full. The third week, there were no red pearls in the glass. So the unconscious mind, by seeing its own patterns, were motivated to change behavior for it to fit their own self-perception of being professional doctors. They didn't have to point fingers. They didn't have to use negative energy. They just really guided that elephant to move in the right direction. You see the difference? This is another example from you know, donation, organ donation systems in a lot of countries. When you ask the citizens of countries if they want to register as organ, donation, uh, organ uh, donors, a lot of them will say yes. About some countries, 80 to 90% will say yes, but they don't come around to registering. If you change the default and say, 
you are registered, but you are free to opt out. It makes a significant difference. Now you will see that we have as many people in the system as, as people who would like to. We make it easy for people. Or you can change the frame. You can talk to people about, you want to lose weight, eat less. You could also help them. And this is the same portion of food. Change the frame. The body will perceive the plate as full when the, when, the, when the plate is smaller, and we will automatically eat less. Or you can prime specific, uh, specific behaviors. You can prime by using colors and words. This is interesting from um, a lot of uh, some prisons um, in Austria, Switzerland, and Texas. They try to get the crime rates to drop in the, in the, in the prisons. What worked was when they gave the, prison, the inmates pink suits and painted the prisons pink. What they're doing in the part of the country and societies where there's a strong social norm dictating that you do not hit girls, what they're trying to do here is activate that social norm because the color pink associates with girls. There was a bonus to this. What they found was, and they didn't anticipate this, less of the inmates returned back to the prison after having been in society again. The researchers now conclude or interpret that this could, have to, could, could be an issue of self-perception. It doesn't match their self-perception of being macho bad guys to have to go back into a pink environment. <laughs> All right, so if we take these simple interventions, keep the freedom of choice, you don't give in sentiments, you don't punish and apply that to the field of inclusion and diversity, that's where you get inclusion nudges. When I came up with this, it was because I had to find another way to work. It's simply too hard to be the one who has to convince 19,000 people to change behavior. Um, so I started applying these techniques and worked with this for some years. I was introduced to Lisa Kapinski, and she said, that's interesting, because I've been, done, been doing similar things. So we joined forces. And we coined this, this term so we start sharing it and design this framework so we're easier to do it systematically by ourselves and our own as internal change agents, but also for it to share it in our networks with all the others that we're crying for the same. We need more behavioral changes. All the programs are not paying off. We made this uh, guidebook on inclusion nudges. I'll return to that, but it's really a contribution from a lot of people from other organizations as well, giving these examples. So there's plenty of you to be inspired by. Um, by all the people who have contributed to this. But an inclusion nudge is a behavioral intervention. You can make the brain be more inclusive without people having to reflect upon it all the time. We're simply talking too much, asking too much of our people. We use it in the whole framework of the life uh, cycle um, circle. We use it to change organizational culture, the norms, and the way we work in our teams. So let me give you an example. We use three different kinds. The first one is not about making people only rationally understand this, the business case of inclusion diversity. It's about making people feel the need to change. It's the elephant we have to appeal to. So this is about motivation. The other one is the process inclusion nudge. We have so many organizational processes already. We can integrate little elements in, there, in those so that we can help the brain make a more objective decision process instead of such a biased process. We can also reframe the whole issue in those associations to diversity and inclusion uh, by not talking so much or the way we set the targets. We have to change the whole discourse. Unfortunately, a lot of the diversity and inclusion is stuck in a discourse of nice to have. It's kind of like we can do it when we have the time. If there's budget cuts, often it's cut or the whole position for the head of inclusion and diversity is just disappearing. This happens in a lot of organizations. It's stuck in the wrong discourse about morality. We're doing this for the sake of somebody. We're kind of helping those women. They can't get up there themselves and kind of helping the minorities. The wrong discourse. What we need to get is that implicit association to performance and innovation, the business discourse, that resource discourse. And we don't do that by talking. There are other ways of doing this. So let me give you some examples of feel the need. This is one. You already did this one. This motivates your unconscious mind to do something about this because now I've seen those behavioral patterns. I've seen how I rate people. Often goes against my intentions. 
This is from Lisa Kapinski. She was working in a huge international at the time. She had to get buy-in from the executive management group for a reverse um, sponsor, or sponsoring program. This is about sponsoring the people and the talent who are not as visible. So what she did was she took a picture of all 130 people who are ready to get up to the next level. And she asked the CEO or the um, executive management group to just start calling out the names of the people they recognized. <coughs> And she moved all the men, and she said, just continue calling out the people you know. They didn't know a lot. This was her way of showing them that there were a lot of women in the organization that were not as visible for their performance as the men. She didn't have to convince them. They came to the conclusion themselves. It makes a significant difference in terms of how they buy in and give their commitment to changing this. They offered voluntarily to be the sponsors of a lot of these women. We do this kind of um, interaction intervention with the leaders in, in, in All the Foods, designed by Cook Ross. This is a fictional CV and a, res like a, a resume and a narrative about candidates. There are eight different candidates. We designed this based on real people in the organization. They have a fictional position. Each manager, they get a candidate, and they then rate them from a scale to zero to 100%. How likely is it that you would hire this candidate or promote this person? What's interesting is when they score them, they use the entire scale, but the eye-opener and the nudge, the inclusion nudge, is when we tell them that those eight candidates are 100% identical, except for the name, the picture, the skin color, and the gender. That's an eye-opener for them, especially when they see, or when they think that they're doing this based on objective screening criteria. This is a highly biased process. What's interesting is that in the Western world, there is another pattern. Khalifa Muhammad always scores the lowest, and Sonia Young, they're both women, always scores the highest. It fits perfectly into the global norm. The Asians scored higher on competency, the Muslims lower on competency. That was an eye-opener of dimensions, and the conversation completely changed based on this. They said, how can we make sure we make better decisions? I didn't even tell them what was in the global policy. This was not about compliance. This was motivation to make a better choice about who we hire, making sure that we get the most competent and not the one from our own tribe, or who fits into that implicit norm of how you're supposed to look. This is another one. You know, everybody's talking about creating relationships and building networks. But a lot of times there are so many patterns of homogeneity and we tend to seek out information and share knowledge with the people who are similar to ourselves. Right, we tend to network with the same set of people. They know each other also. At the same time, if they're in, within a radius of five kilometers, we network even more with them because they're visible to us or they have four more similarities to ourselves. You can tell managers this and they get it. Okay, that's not good. I should do something about this. But they're not likely to do something about it because they're very busy. Whereas when they see their pattern, they immediately do something about it. So what we do is we ask them to rate their inner circle, the people who they would seek out advice from, those they dare to make themselves vulnerable to, but they don't know how to deal with this challenge. And they rate them up against themselves, so they put themselves in the first line. And when there is a similarity to themselves, they just mark it like this. And then we ask them to simply cross those people out who have four or more similarities to themselves, according to what research shows us. Simply, we ask them to cross it off the list. It's a little bit painful for them to cross them off the list. Doesn't mean they're not, it's not like we're saying, don't pick up the phone when they call you. It's just, we're telling them, if you want to be innovative and release your own innovative potential, you need to find somebody who can give you more diverse perspectives. Who are you exposing yourself to? And what kind of diversity or kind of perspectives are you exposing yourself to? Or do you seek confirmation from similar others? I don't have to give them the answer. They come up with the answer themselves. They have it right here. And we ask them to look for another pattern. Gender, you know, age, function. When they sit there with this and they see their pattern and they're vis visible to them, things start happening. And all the managers that have done this and I meet, they say, it's, it's quite easy. I'm just reaching out to people I already created a relationship to because I saw the pattern. I'm starting to reach out to somebody who can break that. I already have the relationship, and really I'm just doing baby, baby, baby step changes. And an example of process inclusion nudges. 
It's about the ability and simplicity on how to make better choices. So we know from symphony orchestras, and a lot of you know these research, so I'm not going to get into it, but what they did was this uh, anonymous screening process. The musicians would do the audition behind the screen, significantly changed. Um, I think some of them had up to about 40% more women in the orchestras, and the ethnic makeup also changed uh, uh, significantly. We can do this in our organizations. Anonymize the, the candidate screenings, you know, e recruiting systems. When we ask our headhunters to deliver a diverse list of candidates, ask them not to give you the names, the pictures. Why would you want it? It might be a little bit frustrating in the beginning, but your brain will get used to it. And once you, 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 you have people come in for interviews, of course you would know their identity. Or ask, have somebody participate by phone in the interviews. It makes a difference in terms of what you hear and, and who you perceive as the most competent. The managers and all are also splitting up their interviews in two. It's a simple little trick. Instead of sending the candidate home after the interview, what they do is they go out with their diverse recruiting team, they do the first evaluation, they go back in with the candidate to make the first evaluation. Here they have the chance to make sure that nobody really seduced them, that they ask the same you know, amount of critical questions and. They can then talk about the biases in that little first evaluation. When they go back in with the candidate, what often happens is that the candidates say, oh, we're so nice. It was kind of like we recognized each other. We knew each other now. I felt more like myself. It means they perform differently. It makes a difference in terms of we evaluate them. Oh, you can change the default. In successful planning, a lot of times out of really good intention, we ask, who's ready? And we force our brain to find arguments for those who are ready. If you change the default and say, everybody's ready now, now you have to argue, why not? It's a simple trick. It makes a huge difference for what your brain starts to look for or see. I'm going uh, to skip the movie so you don't have to put that one on. Um, in a lot of our uh, team processes or task-solving processes or decision-making processes, we tell people out of good intention. You know, the facilitator will go, everybody just speak up. Just share what's on your mind, you know, your critical perspectives. We, we need it to make a better decision. But the problem is that we conform to the group. We follow the herd. So if everybody else is saying something, it's very, very big risk that the rest of us will follow them. About one third of us conform to what the majority in a group says. And they don't even have to say anything. If there's silence, there's a lot of us who's not going to be speaking up and say what we think. There's a simple trick to change this. We can have conformity drop by two thirds by simply asking people to write their perspectives. So it's more like anonymous, that we have more psychological safety. Write it down, it changes. So Solomon asked psychologist, he did all kinds of great experiments. You can find a lot of these on YouTube. I encourage you to check a look at it. It's quite scary what happens. But when they, once they said to pe the, test people, the test person coming in, they said, listen, you're a bit late, so if you write down your answer instead, then people would be there you know, true to what they believed and what they saw. You can also make little groups. You know, Instead of asking people to speak up, you say, share your perspectives, your most, most critical voice. And you can even say to people, share each other's. So when you have to share it with a bigger group, you don't share your own. You share the one you just spoke with. And you're creating psychological safety. So a lot of these little tricks can make a difference in how we leverage diversity of perspectives available to us in the teams. Another example of framing. Change that perception. Make it, make it go from nice to have diversity, inclusion of diversity is something nice to have when we have the time, to a business imperative. We need this. So in all the foods, we try to change the norm. Instead of setting a target for diversity, 30% women in management, we flip the norm. We said we're setting a target for how we compose high-performing teams. In the team, you should aim for having maximum 70% of the team members with the same gender. Maximum 70% of team members with the same nationality and maximum 70% of your team members with the same educational background, maximum 70% of your people from the same generation. We're not going to take your bonus away if you don't. It is not a tick the box. This is about it makes sense for your business. Do you want high performance? Make sure that you compose your team of less homogeneity and make sure that you, of course, also make sure that the team as an inclusive way of working. 
I have not met any resistance on this, whereas when I used to set diversity targets 30% women, they would be like, really? We need to keep helping the women? We already have equality. But this is not about that, because then it became a fix the woman issue. This is not about fixing the women, this is about high performance. Or like Lisa, in, in one of the big organizations, we tend to ask these neutral questions like, uh, are you international mobile, right? There is an implicit norm, it's not really written anywhere, but if you don't tick that box in that system, you do not have as good career opportunities as the others. The problem is, the male and the, and, and the female brain doesn't pick up the question the same way. They don't get it, they understand it the same way. Women will typically be international mobile right now. Oh, geez, my husband also have a career, right? The kid just started school. I have to do the groceries on my way home. I'm, I'm not really that international mobile right now. I'm going to wait. The men, they're like, there's not like there's an offer right now, right? I mean, and I know it's important for my career. So I'm going to just take the box. I'll figure it out when we get there, right? change the question, would you consider an international assignment within the next few years? Bam! 25% more women will take that box. It's not because 25% more women were all of a sudden international mobile, it's because they perceived the question differently. We reframe the question, you reframe what happens in people's mind. That's a much more inclusive question than the other one. Or you can show majority data first instead of just focusing on the minority. If you want to change things from not being a focus on minorities, about all of us, make sure it's about all of us. Humanize the numbers. We, we believe what we see. So if you already have a lot of successful people that can break the norm, make sure that you showcase the pictures. You can prime with words. Right? There are so many studies that show if you do math test, and right before the women are doing the math test, if you mention the, na the word woman, they perform worse on math test. Whereas you mention, say, their race, like Asian, they perform better on the math test because it fits that norm of Asians being smart, women being less mathematically smart. This is just a word. You do experiments with people who play golf, you say to them, listen, this is a test in your physical athletic abilities. The black perform the best. You tell them that this is a test on intellectual ability. The white perform better. Doesn't make sense, does it? These are just words. You tell people, go pick up your candidate for this interview. Or you tell people, go pick up the elderly candidate. People walk slower. Right? That's how the human mind works. We can use this for the benefit of the organization and the people in it and to leverage those human resources. The question is, how could you use words and colors and images to prime people to move in the right direction? Make it easier for the elephant to get that, or make it easy for the rider to get that elephant in the right direction. This is just an example from uh, Swarovski. They needed more mix of candidates to, to uh, apply for the positions. Only thing they put up there was, we're looking for female and male motivated talent. A lot more women applied. It didn't change anything, really. Yes. So these are the principles of inclusion nudges. Motivate both the automatic and the reflective system of the brain. And these target those specific behavioral drivers. I know that's a big thing to ask you, and I would encourage you to start studying and reading a bit more about the brain, because this is a manipulation of the brain, but in, you know, in accordance with our good intentions. But there are about 150 different biases. It's important to know which one you can target so, so uh, you can take people on this journey. And make sure you keep it simple. So this is kind of how we created like a cultural change in the organization. This is how we created a bottom-up where people were pulling each other because a lot of these interactions and exercises we've done is, uh, and, and how we designed the system is something the managers is just integrating into daily operations. It's not like a standalone thing we also have to do when we have the time. It's become an integrated part of doing smart leadership. We don't call it out an unconscious bias training. We don't call this inclusion training. This is just 
part of the leadership when it's training, or this is just part of a global recruitment policy. The words you choose to frame this is absolutely crucial. I just want to share with you just uh, the, the personal change journey this has been for me. Um, some of you might be thinking, uh, she got her act together, right? She's standing up on stage and sharing her great story and these examples. I really didn't have my act together. I mean, this doesn't come from having studied anthropology or behavioral economics and being super smart. This came by the biggest failure in my career. That's why I started doing this. I'd been giving 45 minutes at the executive team meeting to present that 10-year business strategy and diversity inclusion. The CEO, he goes after 15 minutes, he says, you just stop. It wasn't one of those, let's stop and explore together. This is really interesting. Let's try to find out what we can do with this. It was just a full stop. And he says to me, we do not need to understand this intellectually. This is simply too complex. What you need to know is uh, we believe in this with our hearts, else we wouldn't have hired you to do this work. Your job is to get all the people in this organization to move, start moving, and we need you to get us to run. I was like, okay. And you don't have to continue. Okay. I was like, in a panic, complete panic. I'm walking out. I turn to the door and I say, just to understand, you want me to get everybody running in this organization, but you don't want to understand why or where are we going to go? Yes. And I'm like, that can take a long time before you meet them. He's like, that's what it takes to create these kind of changes. If you do your job right, we will get there. That was my mandate. I'm walking out feeling a little heavy on the shoulders. And uh, I'm licking my wounds for about a month, feeling that this was the biggest failure of my life. I never failed in front of 10 executives like this. I've not, been invi- I've not even been invited in since, actually, so it was a huge failure. But what happened was I started thinking, if this was not a failure, but if this was his way of guiding me to make sure that we would reach the target of more inclusiveness, if he guided me, what, what, what was he actually telling me? This is what he was telling me, exactly this. It's not going to make a difference that we get it. Make us feel it and make us run. Your job is to get us in the direction of inclusionness. So I look back and I ask myself this question. This became my assessment. I said, when I have done anything at all that was a success, what did I do? And it was a big surprise to me when I found out that only by coincidence had I appealed to the elephant when I had succeeded in creating those behavioral changes. It was too random. So I made a decision. This became my assessment. Every time I did anything, any kind of intervention, training or designing processes to get buy-in or making presentations, I would make sure that I was appealing to the elephant more than the rider. I have not presented for three and a half years one single business case. And I have never seen as big behavioral changes as I do now in the organization. So my change process was like this. I came into the organization as the anthropologist. I was kindly asked to fit in. I tried to fit in. I really did what I could to tone down everything. <laughs> I was really trying to fit in. And it wasn't until I was lying down, feeling like I was being beaten up, and that I got up again because the CEO dared to be frank and authentic in his leadership. And I thank him to this day that he did that day, even though it felt like a big failure. But for me, it was a turning point. It was a turning point where I got up again and I said, I need to do this, I need to be who I am, and I need to start doing what I know to do right. And when I tell you this personal story, it's because I want you to reflect upon how often do we invite people into our organizations to make a difference. We ask them to socialize to being like the rest of us, and knowing who we are, we follow the herd, and we really just want to be accepted by the group, and we tone down all these sides of identities and all the great stuff we could do. How many of you are actually able to leverage people's full potential? I invite you to take a good thorough look. Is there more we could do to invite people to get up again after the failures? We'll make a trip. How do we get up again? And how do we make people blossom and be their full self? So that's my invitation to do today. And um, 
to do this, I started the socioeconomic organization. It's really about making internal practitioners apply more of these <coughs> techniques. It's about the surplus of this organization. We'll make sure that everybody has access to this. And um, we, just, we made this inclusion not just guidebook. It's really just a global sharing initiative. You give one contribution, and you get all 50 back, mm -hmm. free of charge. If you, don't, if you didn't give a contribution, you can buy this at a really extremely, ridiculously low price. Um, based on two years of hard work, we've just poured out our experience. This is for you. And we invite you to join this community of sharing what works. Um, it makes a difference, and we believe it can make a better world and better organizations. So thank you for your time, and I hope you practice.